Hello, and welcome to Controllers Tech. This is the fourth video in the STM32 Modbus series, and today we will start with the STM32 as a slave device. We will see how to program the STM32 as a Modbus slave device, where it will respond to the queries sent by the master to read the holding and input registers. Basically we will be working with the function codes 3 and 4, but this time from the slave perspective. We will also see how the slave send an exception in case it cannot handle the request made by the master device. I have already prepared a library and written the code, and I will explain it as we move along with the video. I have also made some changes in the connection. As I mentioned in the first video, the Modbus is a protocol and it can work with any communication standard. Today I am simply using the UART to communicate with the computer. I am using the Nucleo F446 controller, and connecting via the UART is easier with this controller. Here you can see I am using the UART too. The mode is set to asynchronous mode. The board rate is 115200, word length of 8 bits with no parity and 1 stop bits. I have also enabled the interrupt, so that we can receive data in the interrupt mode. The pins PA2, and PA3 have been set as the TX and RX pins. The connection with the Nucleo board is pretty simple, you just need to connect the controller using the USB cable. You can also use some UART to RS232 converter, or use the RS485 module as we did in the previous videos. Anyway, let's see the code now. Here I have defined the RX and TX buffers. We know the maximum data that can be transferred on the Modbus is 256 bytes, therefore the size is set as 256 bytes for both. In the main function we will receive the data in the RX data buffer, using the function you are to receive to idle interrupt. Whenever there is an idle line detected in the incoming data, the RX event callback will be called. The incoming data will be stored in the RX data buffer. Inside the callback function, we will check if the first byte in the RX data buffer is matching with the slave ID, that we have defined in the Modbus slave header file. Here I have defined the slave ID as 7. The next byte in the RX data buffer corresponds to the function code, requested by the master. If the master has requested the function code 3, we will call the function read holding registers. And if the function code is 4, we will call the function read input registers. Before we move on to the Modbus source file, I want to clarify that the CRC file is the same that we have used in the previous tutorials. Here I have created a Modbus slave.c file, and a Modbus slave.h file. These files will remain the same in the upcoming tutorials also, and we will keep adding the new function codes to them. Here I have defined the RX and TX data buffers again, but as the external variables. They are originally defined in the main file. I have also defined the UART handler here as an external variable. Next we have the send data function, which will be used to send the data to the UART. This time I have added the parameter size, which would indicate how many bytes of the TX data buffer has already been occupied before this function is called. This is because now the CRC will be calculated in this function itself, and the size parameter will be needed to calculate the CRC. Let's assume the size is set to 9, that means the 9 bytes have been occupied in the TX data buffer. We will store the CRC values at the 9th and 10th positions. And finally send the buffer to the UART with 12 bytes in total. Reading of holding and input registers are exactly the same things. There are no changes between them, so I will only explain one of them. 
On the top right you can see the query sent by the master. To read the registers, we will first calculate the start register address. The address sent by the master is in two bytes format, so we need to shift the higher byte to the left by eight positions, and then add it with the lower byte. Next we will calculate the number of registers the master has requested. This data is again sent in the two byte format, and we will convert it to 16 bit data. We will perform a check if the number of registers is within the limits of 1 to 125. If it is not, the slave will send an exception. We will talk about the exceptions, and how to send them later in the video. This limit of 125 registers, is as per the Modbus standard. Next we will calculate the address of the last register requested by the master. This is equal to the start register address, plus the number of registers, minus 1. This minus 1 is because the register address starts from 0. If the end register address is more than 49, the slave will again send an exception to the master. Actually there can be a total of 10,000 registers, with the end register address of 9,999, but I have only set the values for the 50 registers. Therefore if the master is requesting the value of 50th register, or 51st register, the slave should send an exception. If there are no exceptions so far, the slave will send the register data to the master. We will start preparing the TX data to be sent. The TX data should contain the slave ID, the function code, the number of bytes the slave is going to send, the actual data in bytes, and the two bytes for the CRC. Here we will copy the slave ID first, then the function code, which is the second byte of the RX data buffer. Then the number of bytes the slave is sending, which is twice the number of registers the master has requested, as each register is 16 bit in size, and occupies 2 bytes. I am using an index variable to keep track of how many bytes have been written to the TX data buffer. Now we will start copying the register values into the buffer. We will repeat this for loop as many times as the number of registers requested by the master. The first byte will be the higher data byte, so we will shift the 16 bit register data to the right by 8 places. Once the higher byte data is stored in this position, the index variable will increment. Then the lower byte data will be stored at the very next position, and here we simply end the 16 bit data with 0 cross ff. All the values in the database are supposed to be 16 bit values, and this is why we need to convert them to 2 8 bit values. I have arranged the values in a way that the register address between 10 to 19 will have values starting with 1, and addresses from 20 to 29 will have the values starting with 2, and so on. Once we have converted the 16-bit register values into 2 bytes, we will increment the start address, so that the control can go to the next register value in the queue. The index variable keeps on updating, keeping track of the number of bytes that has been stored in the TX data buffer. Once the data has been extracted, we will send the data. The CRC will be calculated in the send data function itself. We will pass the index variable to the send data function, indicating the number of bytes in the TX data buffer. After everything is done, we will return one to indicate the success. So we have two parts in the function, first where we are checking the query made by the master, and then the second, where we will respond to the query by sending the register values. Now let's talk about the exceptions. Here again I am referring to this document from the modbus.org. The exception responses topic can be found on page 101. Here we are interested in the last paragraph. So if the slave device cannot handle the query, for example if the request is to read a non-existent register, the slave will return an exception with the nature of error.
Exception response has two fields, the function code field, and the data field. Normally the slave should echo the function code sent by the master. This is what we did here when there was no exception. But during an exception, the slave adds a 1 to the MSB of the function code, and returns it. In the data field, the slave returns the exception code. The exception codes can also be found in this document. Here we have many exceptions, but we will work with the first three of these. We have the illegal function, when the unknown function code is received by the slave. There is illegal data address, when the data address requested by the master is not available in the slave. And the illegal data value, when a value in the query of the data field is not an allowable value for the slave. We will use these exceptions, and we will also see them in working. I have defined these three in the Modbus slave header file. Here I am using an exception, when the number of requested registers is outside the allowable range as per the Modbus standard. The slave will send an illegal data value exception. And when the end register address is outside the defined ones, the slave will send illegal data address exception. The Modbus exception function takes the exception code as the parameter. Here the first byte is the slave ID. The next byte is the modified function code, when we add a 1 to the MSB of the function code. And the third byte is the exception code itself. Then we will send this buffer, where the CRC will be calculated in the send function itself. So this is how the read holding registers function was written. The read input registers function is exactly the same, so I don't need to explain it again. The only difference is in the database definitions. The input registers database is defined as a constant array, so that it cannot be modified. Whereas the holding registers is a simple array, which the master will be able to modify in the future video. This is it for the explanation, let's see the working now. Let's build and debug the code. I am using the Simply Modbus Master software, which can be downloaded from their official website. Here the mode is set to RTU. The COM port is 5, where the SDM32 as a slave is connected. The board rate is 115200, 8 data bits with 1 stop bit, and no parity. This is the same configuration that we did in the Cube MX. The slave ID is 7, we have defined it in the STM32 program. We will start with reading holding registers, and let's say I want to read the register at 40001. I want to read only one register, and the offset should also be 40001 as per the Modbus standard. I am expecting the unsigned 16-bit value. Make sure this high byte first is checked. Based on the configuration, here is the query the master is going to send. It contains the slave ID, the function code, the start register address, the number of registers, and the CRC. Let's run the code now. Press and button to send the query to the slave. The master has received the response. Here you can see the data received for the register at 40001 is zero. Let's read three registers now, starting from the same address. Here you can see the response received by the master. It contains 11 bytes, and this is the same as what the master was expecting. Here you can see the data received for the respective registers. If you check the registers database, it is the same data that we stored here. Now let's read 5 registers, starting from the address 40011. We have received 15 bytes in total, and you can see the value for each register. These are the 5 registers the master had requested, 
and the master has received the same values that we have defines here. Let's see the exceptions now. As I have already mentioned, there are a total of 50 registers defined in the database. Now say for example, if the master wants to read two registers, starting from 40,050. The register 40,050 is present in the database, but the 51 is not. Therefore the slave will return an exception saying the address is illegal. Here you can see the master was expecting 9 bytes, but it only received 5. The exception response will always have 5 bytes, one for the slave ID, one for the function code, one for the exception code, and two for the CRC. So we saw the exception for the data address, now let's see the exception for the data value. Let's say the master wants to read 126 registers, starting from the 40,001. We know as per the standard, the master can request a maximum of 125 registers. Since the master has requested 126 of them, the slave will send an exception about the illegal data value. There is one more thing I want to point out here. Let's say the master wants to read 2 bytes starting from 40,035. Here you can see the negative values in the respective addresses. This is because the data type is set as a 16-bit signed integer. Let's change this to 16-bit unsigned integer. Now you can see the positive values. They are the same as what we stored in the database. Now let's quickly see the function code for, to read the input registers. Let's say the master wants to read the 10 registers, starting from the 30,001. Here you can see the master is expecting 25 bytes in total. It has received all the 25 bytes, and you can see the values for the respective registers. These are the 10 values the master has received, and they are exactly the same as what we have stored in the database. So I hope you understood the video. We saw how to program STM32 as a slave device, so that it can respond to the queries regarding holding and input registers. We will cover the reading of coils and discrete input in the next video. I am going to use the same code with a few additions. That's it for today. You can download the code from the link in the description. Leave comments in case of any doubt. Keep watching, and have a nice day ahead.